In 1985, a group of hikers were making their way down a trail in this big forest in Southern California when one of them looked through the trees off to their side and they saw there was a stream running down parallel to the trail they were on. And in this stream, the hiker saw something that just didn't look right. And so the hikers left the trail and made their way down to the stream. And when they actually saw the thing that stood out to this hiker that was in the stream, they just stopped and stared at it. It would take investigators another three years before they would finally understand what the hikers had just found. But before we get into today's story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, the next time the like button is having a bad day, offer to make them a cup of tea. But make sure you put the milk in before the water and use Splenda instead of sugar. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. In 1985, 17-year-old Michelle Avila, who just went by the nickname Missy, was a high school junior living in the working class town of Arlita, California, which is located just north of Los Angeles, California. Despite Missy being very physically small, she was under five feet tall and barely weighed 95 pounds, she had a big presence about her and it made her very popular at her school. Not only was she incredibly beautiful with boys and girls falling over themselves to try to win her affection, but also Missy was just very kind and gentle and didn't seem to take herself very seriously. But life for Missy was not all perfect. A year earlier, during her sophomore year, a nasty rumor had been spread around Missy's high school that Missy had apparently been sleeping with all of these boys who were in established relationships with girls in the school. And even though this rumor was a total lie, by the time the rumor reached the girlfriend friends of these boys that Missy had apparently slept with, these girls believed it. And so to get their revenge on Missy, one day after school when she had walked outside, this group of girls ganged up on her and beat her really, really badly. In fact, the beating was so severe that when Missy came home, her family immediately pressed charges on the girl that seemed to kind of lead the attack. Her name was Sonia Bon. But despite Missy and her family immediately filing these charges, the case dragged for months and months and months. But finally, by October 1st, 1985, so at the beginning of Missy's junior year, Missy was within a week of actually going to court and taking the stand and testifying against Sonia. And while Missy was certainly nervous about going to court and testifying, she knew deep down she was making the right decision. On October 1st, so a week before before Missy is set to testify, Missy came home from school and she told her mom that she had plans that afternoon to go hang out with her friends. This was fairly routine for Missy, who had a big circle of friends, and so her mother, Irene, told her that was totally fine, but you gotta be home by 6 p.m. Missy agreed, and then just a couple of minutes later, a 17-year-old girl named Laura Doyle, who was very close with Missy, she pulled up outside of Missy's house and she honked the horn. And so Missy heard her, she said goodbye to her mom and to her brother, and then she left the house, ran to Laura's car, hopped inside, and the two girls drove off. A few hours later, at 6 p.m., Missy had still not come home yet. However, her mother, Irene, was not that surprised. Missy was not really a troublemaker, but she really liked staying out with her friends, and so it wasn't that uncommon for her to stay out past curfew and then come home and ask for forgiveness, or she would stay out past curfew and then she would call her mother and ask for more time. And shortly after 6 p.m., the phone rang inside of Missy's house. And so Irene, she hears the phone ringing and she's expecting it to be her daughter. And so she walks over, she picks the phone up and says, hello, but it's not her daughter. It's another young girl's voice. It's Laura's voice, the girl who had picked Missy up after school to go hang out with friends. And before Irene could ask Laura why she was calling, Laura kind of awkwardly asked Irene, hey, is Missy home? And Irene would say, Laura, she left with you. Isn't she with you? No, she's not here. She's running late. Why, what's going on? After Irene said this, Laura began to panic and then she proceeded to tell Irene what happened that afternoon while she was out with 
with her daughter. She said after she picked Missy up, the two of them just kind of drove around town, which they did all the time. And then at some point they made their way over to Stonehurst Park, where Missy and Laura and a bunch of their friends would often go and hang out. And so they drove over to Stonehurst, they made their way into the parking lot. And as soon as they were in there, Laura began looking around for other cars that she recognized to see if maybe their friends were there. But after looking around, she didn't recognize any of the cars. And so Laura just reflexively began turning the car around to leave the park. But as she was doing that, Missy stopped her and said, wait a minute, I know the guys over there. I want to go say hi. And so Laura stopped the car and she looked in the direction that Missy was pointing. And on the far side of the parking lot were these two guys who appeared to be maybe in their late teens, early 20s. Laura did not recognize either of them. And they were standing outside of this blue car, a blue Camaro. Now, Laura was accustomed to Missy just kind of knowing everybody in town because everybody loved Missy and Missy loved everyone. And so this type of situation was not totally uncommon. However, Laura was just not very excited at the prospect of going and hanging out with these two total strangers to her. But she could tell Missy really wanted to. And so she turns to Missy and says, OK, you know, go out there, go say hi to them and I'm going to park and I'll meet you in a second. And so Missy, she hops out of the car and she begins walking over to these two guys and she's waving to them and they're waving back and smiling at her and Laura meanwhile pulls the car into a parking spot she throws it in park and she's about to get out when she notices her gas gauge is below empty and so she calls out to Missy who's now halfway to these two guys and she says hey I'm gonna go fill my car up with gas and then I'll come back and I'll meet you and so Missy turns around and she's like okay bye and so Laura puts her car back in drive and she pulls out of the lot and she heads into town to get some gas a few minutes later when Laura pulled back back into the Stonehurst parking lot, she looked in the direction of where the blue Camaro and the two guys were and where Missy was headed, and they're all gone. Missy is nowhere to be seen. Now, this was 1985, so Laura could not just call or text Missy to see where she had gone. And so instead, Laura just sat in the parking lot looking at the vacant spot where the blue car had been, kind of going over in her mind what she should do. And eventually, she told herself that, you know what, Missy was a big girl, she can handle herself, she knew those guys, I'm sure everything is just fine and those guys will drop her off at her house when she needs to go home. And so even though Laura is telling herself this, she would leave the Stonehurst parking lot and spend a while just kind of driving around town looking for Missy and looking for this blue Camaro and these two guys. And after finding none of them, she would head home. And then right after 6 p.m., Laura picked up the phone and she called Missy's house because she knew Missy's curfew was 6 p.m. and so she should be home by now. But of course, when Missy's mother, Irene, picked up the phone, Laura would learn Missy had not come home. And so Irene and Laura are immediately really worried about Missy, but not to the point where either of them think they should involve the police. Instead, Laura and Irene would spend the next couple of hours after that 6 p.m. phone call calling everybody they could think of that might know where Missy was. And when that yielded no results, Laura and Irene actually met up that night and began going door to door to all of Missy's friends and acquaintances' houses, asking the occupants if they knew where Missy was. But by late that night, no one had given them any information about Missy's whereabouts, and so still feeling very concerned about Missy, Laura and Irene decided the best thing to do was just to go back home and go to bed and hope in the morning Missy turned up or someone contacted them with information about where Missy was. But the following morning, Missy had still not turned up and no one had heard from her. And so that morning, Irene went to the police and told them what was going on. Immediately, the police honed in on Laura and began going over every single detail of what that blue Camaro was doing, what those two guys looked like, you know, what did Missy say about these two guys? Did she give any information about where they might go or who these guys were? And Laura, I mean, she was totally guilt-ridden and emotional about being the last person to see Missy before she has apparently vanished. And she sat there trying to give every bit of information she possibly could about what had happened that day. But unfortunately, she was just too far away from these two guys and their vehicle. She could only give them a sort of basic physical description, which Laura even admitted was not very accurate because it was really far away and frankly she wasn't looking that hard. And so after getting all the information they possibly could from both Laura and Irene, the police launched a very extensive search all over Arlita, California and the surrounding areas. And while they were doing that, Irene and other members of Missy 
Missy's family, along with Laura and other close friends of Missy's, began their own search. But after a couple of days, neither the professional search nor the amateur search had turned up any new information about Missy's whereabouts or the whereabouts of those two guys and their blue Camaro. But then on October 4th, just three days after Missy went missing, Missy would be found. However, it would take investigators another three years to finally make sense of what actually happened to her. Based on eyewitness testimony, here is a recreation of what happened to Missy on the day she vanished. On that day, which was Tuesday, October 1st, 1985, Missy came back from school. She told her mother she wanted to go out and hang out with her friends. Her mother told her, okay, be home by six. And then a couple of minutes later, Laura pulled up outside and honked the horn. And Missy ran outside, hopped in the car, and they drove off. The pair would drive around town for a few minutes before making their way to Stonehurst Park. Now, to understand what happens next, you need some context. Missy had two best friends. One of them was 17-year-old Laura Doyle, who she was with, and the other was another 17-year-old girl named Karen Severson. These three girls had met when they were in grade school, they lived basically on the same street, and they spent virtually every second of every day together. However, a month earlier in September, the trio had had a falling out. Because a month earlier, another rumor about Missy sleeping with boys who had girlfriends began circulating around the school, except this time, the girlfriends in the rumor were Laura and Karen. Now, of course, Laura and Karen were well aware of the fact that a year earlier, Missy had been accused of something similar and it had all been a big lie. And so going into this new rumor, Laura and Karen knew that the likelihood of it being real was very slim, but because this rumor directly involved them and their boyfriends, they felt a little concerned. And so Laura and Karen went to Missy and they said, hey, we don't think it's true, but is it true? Did you sleep with our boyfriends? And Missy immediately is like, are you kidding me? No, I didn't sleep with your boyfriends. Did you see what happened last year? It's the same thing. It's a lie. It's just a rumor. I can't believe you would think I would do that to you. And so pretty quickly, this discussion escalated to a full-blown fight between the girls. Or more specifically, it turned into a full-blown fight between Karen and Missy. Because Laura, she was worked up about it, but pretty quickly she was able to calm down. But Karen, she didn't calm down. Because apparently, Karen had seen Missy at some point flirting with her boyfriend. And so when this rumor began to circulate, Karen felt like, you know what? It could be true. She might have had sex with my boyfriend. And so eventually, the three girls just stopped fighting. Not because they had reached some sort of compromise, but rather because Missy just tried to turn around and walk away. And when she did, Karen wound up and slapped her across the face. And as soon as that happened, all three girls knew a line had been crossed, and now their decade-long friendship was potentially ruined. Over the next couple of weeks, Missy and Laura were able to come together and patch things up, but Missy Missy and Karen continued to avoid each other. However, the distance between them really wore on both of them, and so finally, on the morning of October 1st, Karen would reach out to Missy and she would apologize. And Missy was really touched by this, and before long, Missy and Karen and Laura had made plans for that afternoon to meet up at Stonehurst Park to have a good day together, just like old times. So that afternoon, Laura picks up Missy from her house and the two of them drive around for a bit before heading over to Stonehurst Park where they're planning to meet Karen. But when Laura pulls the car into the parking lot, they look around and Karen is not there. And the blue Camaro and those two guys standing around it on the far side of the parking lot, they weren't there either because Laura had made up the blue Camaro and those two guys. They never existed. That was all just a big cover up for what happens next. A few years ago, I was told that my anger issues were actually tied to something much bigger. I was depressed. But despite agreeing with this conclusion, it was still really difficult for me to go out and get help. I just felt really uncomfortable at the notion of walking into some doctor's office and telling some stranger about my feelings, feelings that I didn't even understand. But with the encouragement of my family and friends, I did seek out a therapist and honestly, it saved my life. So if you have a lot on your mind right now, but you've put it off because it's too uncomfortable to go out and get help, then today's video sponsor, BetterHelp, is for you. 
BetterHelp is a highly reviewed online therapy platform, which means you don't ever have to walk into the doctor's office and have some super intense in-person conversation about your feelings. Instead, you can get the help you need from the comfort of your own home. On BetterHelp, all 20,000 plus therapists, without exception, are licensed, trained, experienced, and accredited psychologists, marriage and family therapists, clinical social workers, or licensed professional counselors. They also all have a master's degree or doctorate degree in their field, and they possess at least three years and 1,000 hours of hands-on experience. Therapy really does work, and BetterHelp is the most accessible, affordable, and convenient therapy option out there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Mr. Ballin. That's Better H-E-L-P, and join the over 2 million people who are taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. Special offer for you, get 10% off your first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash Mr. Ballin. So Laura and Missy, they pull into the parking lot at Stonehurst and they park in a spot and proceed to wait for Karen. And Karen would show up just a couple of minutes later. But when she showed up, all hell broke loose. Karen came flying into the parking lot and came to a screeching stop right up alongside Laura's car. Karen had parked her car so close to Laura's car that Laura literally couldn't open her door without striking Karen's car. And in Karen's car, in the passenger seat, which was closest to Laura's car, was a terrified looking 17 year old named Eva Cherambolo, who was friends with all three of the girls. And that day, Karen had apparently asked Eva to come over for dinner, but after picking Eva up, without giving her any explanation, she had flown over to Stonehurst and then came to this screeching stop right next to Laura's car. And so Eva is sitting in the passenger seat looking at Karen and looking over at Laura and Missy having no idea what's going on, and Karen begins yelling at Eva to roll her window down. And so Eva rolls her window down and Laura and Missy are looking over in absolute astonishment, and then once the window is down on Eva's side, Karen begins screaming across Eva out the window window at the car that Laura and Missy are in. And so Laura and Missy exchange totally confused looks, and then Laura rolls her window down, and suddenly Laura and Missy can hear what Karen is yelling. And Karen is hurling the most vile and horrible insults at Laura not at Missy. It takes Laura a second to realize what Karen is yelling about, but once she realizes that Karen is just ruthlessly insulting her, Laura just turns and begins hurling insults back at Karen. And so the whole time, Laura and Karen are just screaming at each other. Missy and Eva are just sitting in their respective passenger seats, having no clue what's going on. And just as quickly as Karen had arrived and begun screaming at Laura, Karen put her car back in drive and sped right out of the parking lot. And Laura Laura at this point is totally incensed and enraged at Karen for some of the things she had said. And so Laura fired up her car, threw it in drive, and before Missy could tell her otherwise, Laura had sped out of the parking lot after Karen. And for the next 45 minutes, Karen and Laura drove like absolute maniacs north of the city up into the mountains, where the whole time they're driving, Karen is swerving side to side, and she's speeding along these desolate roads, and Laura would speed up and get right on her bumper, like she was experiencing this extreme case of road rage. Now, for the first few minutes of this, both Missy Missy and Eva were desperately trying to get their drivers to calm down and just pull over whatever you're fighting about. It's not worth crashing and dying over. But little did Missy or Ava know, there was something much, much bigger going on between Laura and Karen. And so their requests to stop the cars fell on deaf ears. Finally, after this 45 minute white knuckle insane drive along these mountain roads came to an end when the road they were on kind of funneled them into this dirt parking lot in the middle of this huge forest. And as soon as they reached this parking lot, Karen came to a stop and Laura narrowly avoided smashing into her and came to a stop right next to her. And as soon as the two cars were stopped, both drivers hopped out and were immediately in each other's faces, shoving each other, screaming 
at each other, just continuing this awful fight. Eva just stayed in the passenger seat and did nothing. She was just hoping that whatever was going on would eventually end and they could leave. But Missy, she's looking out there at her two best friends who seem like they're about to kill each other. And so Missy decides she's going to get out and try to separate them. And so she begins to open her car door. And the second she does, both Karen and Laura, who are maybe five or six feet away from her car door, they both immediately stop fighting. It was like a switch had been thrown and whatever was going on had come to a complete and total stop. And at the same time, they have suddenly stopped fighting. Both girls simultaneously turn and look at Missy. And before Missy could say or do anything, Karen and Laura ran over and positioned themselves right outside of Missy's door. So Missy could no longer shut the door and Missy could not get out of the car. She was totally trapped. And as soon as Karen was in position right outside of the car, Karen kind of got down and got right in Missy's face and with a very menacing and hissing voice, she looks at Missy and says, you know, this whole thing was a joke. Me and Laura, we weren't actually fighting. We're not mad at each other, but we are mad at someone. We're mad at you. And then Karen and Laura would reach down and pull Missy out of the car and they would slam her back up against the side of Laura's car. And then Laura and Karen pressed up against her and began screaming at Missy that she had slept with their boyfriends and they knew it. And this whole time, Missy is trying to tell them, no, I didn't. I did not sleep with your boyfriends. I don't know what's going on. But at some point, Karen and Laura were screaming so loudly and they were right on top of her that Missy just kind of began to shut down and she went quiet and kind of tucked herself into a ball. And as soon as this happened, Karen and Laura, they grab Missy and they begin pushing her away from the car towards a trail that led into the forest. And Missy, she's four foot ten, 95 pounds. She's tiny. And Karen was five foot two, over 200 pounds. And Laura was five foot six inches tall and weighed 135 pounds. And so Missy knew she could not put up a fight. She had no chance against these two. And so Missy just kind of began shuffling her feet, walking towards this trail. And periodically, Karen and Laura would walk up and push her to walk towards this trail. And as this is happening, Eva, who had been sitting in the car the whole time, she finally got out and kind of walked up behind the group, but didn't participate. She just walked along behind them. And so after a couple of minutes, Karen and Laura had managed to push Missy all the way to the actual start of the trail, this narrow trail that left the parking lot. And at that point, Laura walked around Missy, so she was in front of her, and Karen stayed behind Missy. And the two girls ordered Missy to keep following them into the woods. And Missy did not put up a fight. She just put her head down and continued walking along the trail behind Laura with Karen behind her, periodically pushing her. And then several steps behind Karen was Eva who just continued to do nothing. After the girls had walked for a little while on this trail and were out of sight of the parking lot, Laura came to an abrupt stop and she turned around to face Missy. And by this point, Missy was genuinely terrified. She was crying, she had her head down and she was just hoping that her captors were going to let her go. But but once they stopped and Missy looked up at Laura, Laura wound up and decked Missy right in the face. And as soon as she hit Missy, Karen immediately jumped in. And before long, Missy was on the ground getting punched and kicked and stomped on by Laura and Karen. And again, Eva just stood there watching, doing nothing. Eventually, Laura and Karen would stop beating Missy. And at that point, Laura would pull out a knife and she would reach down and she would grab Missy's hair and she began hacking it off. Missy was not a vain person but she loved her hair. It had to be perfect anywhere she went. It was her prized possession and Laura and Karen knew it. And so Laura, she begins hacking off the hair with her knife and Karen, who wanted to get involved but didn't have a knife, just began grabbing Missy's hair and ripping it out with her fists. Finally, after much of Missy's hair had been hacked off of her head, Laura and Karen stopped and just stood up and looked down at Missy, who was now in the fetal position just crying to herself. But Laura and Karen were not done. At this point, they got out restraints and they tied Missy's hands behind her back and they gagged her mouth. And again, Eva did nothing. Once Missy was completely restrained, Laura got up and began walking towards a nearby stream that was about 10 feet away from them down a hill. And so Laura gets down to the stream. She wades in about halfway where the water comes up about eight inches on her leg. And then she turns around and she looks up the hill at Missy and Karen and Eva, who's off to the side. And Laura, while staring directly at Missy, she reaches down and begins running her fingers through the water and says to Missy, why don't you come down 
down and get in the water with me. When Missy didn't move, Karen, who was standing next to her, hauled her up and then pushed her down the hill. And Missy doesn't have the ability to brace her fall because her hands are bound. And so she slams down on her face and she rolls down to the edge of the water and there she stops. And before Missy can get up, Karen and Laura had descended on her. They had grabbed her by the shoulders and they began dragging her out into the water. And so Eva, who's watching this happen, again does nothing and just turns around and begins running down the trail back towards the cars. When she gets to the cars, she discovers they are both locked, so she can't go anywhere. And she was too far away from anywhere to walk. And so her only choice was just to go back down the trail to where her friends were. And so Eva goes back to this trail and she begins walking in the direction of the stream and as she's walking before she can see any of the girls she hears a terrifying blood-curdling scream coming from somewhere deep in the forest and Eva was so terrified that she stopped where she was she turned around and she ran back to the cars Eva would sit down on the ground between the two cars and she would begin to rock back and forth after nearly an hour of doing that Karen and Laura suddenly emerged from the trailhead soaking wet and laughing. Missy was not with them. After Ava had turned around and run away from the stream to go back to the cars the first time, Laura and Karen had grabbed Missy, dragged her into the water, and laid her on her stomach in the eight inches of water. And so Missy is trying desperately to keep her head out of the water, but Laura comes around and grabs her legs and presses them into the water, and then Karen comes around and grabs the back of Missy's head and forces her head down into the water. Missy would start fighting for her life, trying to wriggle her way out of the water, and at some point she would manage to get out from under their grasp and as soon as her head cleared the water she took in a big breath and then let out that piercing horrifying scream that Ava heard as she was walking back down the trail which scared her and caused her to run away again and after Missy let out that primal scream Karen readjusted her grip and pressed her head back into the water Missy would continue to squirm and fight against Karen and Laura and periodically she'd get her head up out of the water just enough to get a little gulp of air and then she'd choke down a bunch of water and have her head pushed down into the water again until finally Missy's strength just started to ebb and when Karen and Laura sensed that Missy was on the verge of death and she was very weak they seized the opportunity and they leapt off of her just long enough to run over to the side of the stream where there was this big heavy log which investigators would later determine weighed over a hundred pounds so it weighed more than Missy and Karen and Laura they'd pick this log up, they'd walk back into the stream, and they'd drop the log directly on the back of Missy's head, forcing it down into the water permanently. A few minutes after drowning Missy in the stream, Karen and Laura walked out of the trail, they got into their cars, Eva climbed into Laura's car, and the girls just left the parking lot and drove back home, leaving Missy in the woods. Three days later, a group of hikers were in that forest near where Missy had been killed, and they spotted her body in the stream. When police arrived, they found cigarette butts, a beer bottle, and men's overalls lying out near where Missy was found. These items were there entirely coincidentally. They had nothing to do with what happened to Missy, but they somehow made the lie about Missy being with those two guys in their Camaro before she vanished seem more believable. Mostly because when Laura described these two guys to police, she kind of made it seem like they were bad boys or troublemakers, like the type of guys who would go off into the woods and smoke and drink for fun. And so the police just continued to chase down this two guys guys and a blue Camaro lead until the murder case went cold. But three years after Missy was murdered, Eva, who had been threatened by Karen and Laura never to say a word about what she knew, finally came forward to police and told them that Karen and Laura had killed Missy. When Karen, Laura, and Missy became teenagers, Missy really blossomed into this beautiful young woman who everybody seemed to adore. Meanwhile, Laura and Karen had the opposite experience. They felt awkward in their bodies and felt like no one really liked them. And so in time, they became very jealous of Missy and that jealousy turned into resentment and that resentment turned into hatred. And so in 1984, it was Karen and Laura who started that rumor about Missy sleeping with all these boys who had girlfriends. And that lie would get Missy attacked and beat up really badly. 
But that wasn't enough for Karen and Laura. They felt like Missy deserved worse. And so the following year, in September of 1985, Laura and Karen decided to kill Missy. Their plan began with spreading another rumor about Missy, about how she was sleeping around with boys with girlfriends, except this time the girlfriends in this rumor would be Laura and Karen. They did this knowing this rumor would start a fight between the three of them, and they knew that Missy just would not be able to be mad at her friends. She would want to make up with them. And so Karen and Laura, they start this rumor. It does cause a big blowout fight between the three of them. But then after this fight, Laura very intentionally makes up with Missy and kind of says, hey, you know, let's make things right again. And so she pretends to be friends with Missy. And then a couple of weeks later, on the morning of October 1st, Karen would contact Missy. She would tell her how sorry she was. And she asked her, hey, do you want to get together today, all three of us, just like old times? And Missy fell right into their trap because she was so excited at the prospect of getting to spend time with her two best friends who she really did love. And so she quickly agreed to meet up with them. And so Laura and Missy, they arrive in the parking lot of Stonehurst Park, and then Karen comes flying in, and there's this huge fight, and there's this 45-minute drive up into the mountains where they reach this parking lot, and Karen and Laura are fighting with each other, and Missy has no idea what's going on, and then all of a sudden, the fighting stops. Because the fighting wasn't real. It was all rehearsed. Laura and Karen had done that in order to throw Missy off guard and to get her up into this forest up in the mountains where they could kill her. It's unclear why Laura and Karen brought Eva along, but most likely she was brought along as a decoy as well. After Missy's body was found and the police were on this mad hunt to find these two guys and the blue Camaro, Karen actually moved in to Missy's family's home. She told them she just wanted to offer support during this really difficult time, but in reality, she just wanted to keep close tabs on the investigation and any chance she got, she wanted to make sure she threw police and Missy's family off of her and Laura's trail. And so for months, Karen slept in Missy's bed. She ate at the same dinner table where Missy would eat with Missy's family, and Karen would spend hours out in the car with Missy's mother, Irene, and other members of Missy's family driving around looking for clues about where Missy could have gone or who really was responsible for Missy's death. When the truth finally came out three years later that Karen and Laura had been the ones who killed Missy, Missy's family could not believe that their daughter's killer was literally living with them the whole time. Ultimately, Laura and Karen would be found guilty of killing Missy, and they would each be sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. Karen Severson was paroled in December of 2011, and Laura Doyle was paroled a year later in December of 2012. So that's gonna do it. If you got something out of today's episode and you haven't done this already, the next time the like button is having a bad day, offer to make them a cup of tea, but put the milk in before the water and use Splenda instead of sugar. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. We now have a podcast called the Mr. Ball and Podcast, and we upload twice a week, once on Monday and once on Thursday. Mondays are brand new podcast exclusives, and Thursdays are remasters of our best YouTube videos. It's called the Mr. Ballin Podcast, and you can find it on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, basically anywhere you find podcasts, you can find this one. We now have a registered 501c3 charitable organization called the Mr. Ballin Foundation that makes it as easy as possible for you to join me, my family, and my team in supporting those whose lives have been most impacted by violent and heinous crimes. Monthly donors to the Mr. Ballin Foundation Honor Them Society will receive free gifts and exclusive invites to special live events. But the real reward is helping to create a new ending to the story for victims of violent crime. Go to mrballin.foundation and click on Get Involved to join the Honor Them Society today. We also have two additional YouTube channels. One is called Mr. Ballin Shorts. The other is called Mr. Ballin and Espanol. We also put out near daily content on Facebook and Snapchat. Both of those channels are just called Mr. Ballin. If you want to get in touch with me, please follow me on any major social media platform and then send me a direct message. I really do read the majority of my DMs. We also have some really cool merchandise 
price. So head on over to shopmrballin.com to have a look. And if you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit, just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, Facebook, other YouTube channels, the podcast, wherever, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, that's going to do it. See ya.